So if you have your Bibles, let's open up to the Old Testament, the book of Joshua. So glad to be here with you and also glad to be here with my brothers. Uh, I, I Just traveling up here to Reno and, and um, I have an uncle that lives not far from here that I haven't seen in a few years. So I'm looking forward to reconnecting with him while I'm here as well. Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant or assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, children of Israel. And every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, and from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you, but be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. And don't turn from it from the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then... You will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, we pray that you would speak to us now in these moments that we have. God, open our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you just come into this place, Lord? Speak to us, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name. Amen. The nation of Israel had some come to this place of really a critical moment in their existence. For over 400 years, they had been enslaved in the land of Egypt in the midst of their bondage. They cried out to God for deliverance. Most of you, no doubt, are familiar with the story of Exodus and the history of the nation of Israel. But the Lord heard their cries, and He raised up a man whose name was Moses. And through divinely orchestrated circumstances, Moses grew up in the palace of the Pharaoh. But when he became of age, he observed the barbaric treatment of his people. And so he sought and even attempted to deliver them by murdering an Egyptian taskmaster. Soon, Moses' crime was discovered, and he fled to the wilderness where he spent 40 years of his life as a shepherd. And then one day the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush and called him to go down to Egypt and deliver the people. Moses was extremely reluctant to go, but God encouraged him and obediently he went. And when Moses went and met with the Pharaoh, he asked the Egyptian ruler to let the people go. But Pharaoh refused and instead increased the burdens of the people. Moses was so dejected by his apparent failure to free the people, the Lord was uh, had sent him down there and nothing happened. And he said to the Lord, didn't I tell you this was going to happen when you sent me this? Why so I didn't want to come to begin with. And the Lord then spoke these words to Moses and he said this, now you will see what I will do. Okay, you've already done your thing. Great. Now you're going to see what I'm going to do. And in response to the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, the Lord unleashed a series of 10 consecutive plagues that destroyed Egypt and caused them to let the people go. Incidentally, each one of those 10 plagues correlated an attack on the Egyptian false gods that they worshiped. Now, when Israel made their exodus, the Pharaoh again changed his mind and he pursued them to the Red Sea. But the Lord parted the Red Sea, allowed Israel to cross over on dry ground. And when Egypt pursued, the Lord caused the waters to return on the army and drown them in the sea. And following their exodus and following their escape, the next step for the nation was to go into the promised land. But they came to the border. You remember, they were unwilling to cross because of unbelief. 
The miracles that they had seen, the deliverance that they had experienced, they still did not believe. And because of their lack of faith, it sent them into the wilderness for the next 40 years until the entire generation died. Longest funeral march in the history of the world. Every day, there's the death. Every day you're at a memorial. I go to a memorial or perform or oversee a memorial, and it, it rocks me. I mean, it's tough to be in those situations, and you watch the grief. Imagine every single day somebody's dying. Somebody's going to die today, if they just knew it. The only two that survived from that former generation, Caleb and Joshua. After 40 years, the time had come for Joshua now to take the next generation into the uncharted territory of the promised land. And it was in that moment... As they were preparing to go, somewhere they had never been before, and leading in a way that he hadn't led before, the Lord speaks to Joshua, as we just read, and says, listen, I've commanded you to be strong and of good courage. You're not to be afraid. You're not to be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Why did Joshua need to be strong and of good courage? Why did God say to him, do not be afraid? Because he was. You only tell people, don't be afraid, who are. And listen, Joshua was fearful. This is uncharted territory. He'd never gone this way before. And that brings us back to verse 1. God allowed something to happen in the nation. You know what it was? It was a national tragedy. What was it? Moses died. Moses died. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, Hey, my servant Moses is dead. Moses had been the leader. God spoke to Moses. God called down the, uh, the plagues through, the, through Moses. Moses raised up his staff, part of the Red Sea. Moses was the one who went up onto the mountain. Moses was the one who came down with his face glowing. Moses was the one who had the Ten Commandments. I mean, Moses was the guy. He was the guy that hit the rock and water came out. He was the guy that prayed and manna came down. Moses got a glimpse of God's glory. He was a legend among the people when you really think about it. And Joshua, he'd been second in command. This couldn't have come at a worse time for him. Here they are at the border of the land, 40 years of wandering. An entire generation has passed away, and now Moses is gone too. Folks, in one sense, Moses represented the past. He's mentioned six times just in these few verses. Moses is also mentioned 57 times in the book of Joshua. It would have been very easy, listen to me on this, it would have been very easy to look at what God had done in the past and think, I don't, I don't know if we can continue to go forward. Hey church, listen up, listen to this. God has done some amazing things. Here we are celebrating a milestone for the Calvary Magazine. Look at all that God has done. And we look back and we think, wow, that's amazing. And I just looking at all those covers and even scrolling through that book. I remember getting those magazines wherever I was. And I remember that story. And I remember that. And I remember that picture and, and, and how encouraged I was. And hoping maybe one day my picture would be in there. I and mean, that's just a fact. That's just a fact. <laughs> Come on, pastors. You know. Yes, man, man, I'd love to be. I just don't. And then it was just, I don't want to just be in there. I want to be on the cover. Hey, Tom, could you get a, you know, you just, get, guys, slip you a 20. Could you just maybe, no, you know, you just, if you could just be in there. And then you saw your face in it. And you're like, man, everybody needs a copy of this. You, know, you, bought, you buy even more because you want to distribute them to your family at Christmas. I mean, you just want, I, I'm in a magazine. I don't know if you've seen this. I mean, we didn't have much going on in ministry, but, but our picture was in there and that was cool. I'm speaking about these guys over here. I wasn't thinking that. It was just these guys over here. No, we all were thinking that. We all were thinking that. We all were thinking that. Ken was in it like every other week, you know. It was like, had his own column. No, you didn't have your own column. But you know what I mean? Enough about this nonsense. Joshua, what I'm saying to you folks, it's great what God has done, and we rejoice in it, and we look at it, and, and we think, but this is not a hitching post. This is a guidepost. This is what God has done. Hitherto the Lord has brought us thus far, but there's more to be done. There is more that God wants to do. And so what I'm saying to you, and I'm saying to myself, I don't want to settle. I don't want to stop. I don't want to just, it's good to look and see what God's done. And then I put my hands back on the plow and I say, let's get after it. What, God, what do you want to do next? Because God's up to something. Folks, we are coming into an incredible time in the history of our nation. And you guys see it. You know it. There are things happening that I never, I couldn't have even imagined what, what's happening now. If you would have told me 10 years ago 
15, 20 years ago. I mean, what we're seeing unfold right now that you think that's crazy. No way. No way there's going to be a month dedicated to don't even go there. I mean, there's not, that can't be the case. Veterans get one day for sacrificing their lives and these people get a month for choosing sin and wickedness and evil and that which is unnatural. This is where we live. It's happening. So here's Joshua. How's he going to go forward? You know, Joshua, when you think about it, Joshua actually couldn't go forward if Moses was still there. God took Moses, and Joshua was then able to move forward. The Lord, listen, the Lord was about to do something new, something unexpected, something that had not yet been done. And it came out of pain, it came out of loss, it came out of difficulty. Moses had run his race. He had fulfilled his calling. It was now time for Joshua to step into his. Three times in this chapter, the Lord exhorts Joshua, be strong and of good courage. God had a plan for Joshua's life, and it was going to take strength. It was going to take courage. There was a mission for him to fulfill, a new purpose for him to walk in. Listen, you guys know this. God has purposes and plans for us to walk in. He's not done with us. Isn't it the time to just kick back and retire? Well, I'll leave that to all the young. I don't do that stuff anymore. I used, you know, back in, I'll tell you what, I was in that magazine back in, 90, you should have saw me in 97. I went over to, what are you doing now? What am I doing now? We want to keep going forward. And perhaps, like Joshua, you've gone through some pain in recent days. Maybe you've lost something. Maybe you've lost someone. Maybe some grief. Sometimes God uses those things, the painful things in life, to launch us into something that we never would have even thought of or even pursued had this not happened. And we don't see it in the moment, and yet God uses it for good. When you look back and you you look over Joshua's life and you read of his account in Scripture, you, you know what you realize? God had been preparing him for this moment his whole life, his whole life. Think about it. We don't know much about Joshua's background other than he was the son of none, That's what you know. But he was a slave. Probably born in Egypt, a slave. And like the rest of his people, he served in rigorous bondage under a taskmaster's whip. But he didn't didn't allow that to stop him from fulfilling God's calling on his life. Joshua, I love this, he never plays the victim. He chose not to dwell on the past. He did not remain a slave But he was delivered, he was liberated, and he became a mighty warrior. Joshua was actually prepared through what he endured growing up in Egypt. But also he was prepared through the fierce battles that he fought. You know, if you go back to Exodus chapter 17, verse 9, just make a mental note of it. But Moses said to Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight against Amalek. And Joshua led them into victory. Church, I know that you are aware there are battles to fight. There are battles that we have fought. Some of them have been chronicled in these magazines. We look back and we see all the different, some of those pictures. Listen, there was a lot of battles that went into those those places, whether you went to Eastern Europe, whether you went to Russia, all these different places. There's a lot of stuff that that you didn't see, you know, caught in in a photograph that was going on behind the scenes in prayer closets, in places where we were battling to get there. And How are we going to get money to go? And what's God going to do? And is somebody going to take us off the street if we just set up our equipment? I mean, all of these things, there were battles to be fought, but now there are new battles to be fought. And here's what I'm learning. One battle prepares me for the next. God God allows you to go through one battle here. He allowed David to fight lion, to fight bear, in order that he might score off with a giant and say, let's go. I mean, it just prepares you for the next thing. Joshua was also prepared not only through what he, the environment in which he grew up in, God used that, the fierce battles that he fought, but Joshua was also prepared by faithfully being a servant. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 24, verse 13, that Joshua was Moses' assistant. Assistant. He served alongside of him, held up his arms in one sense. He also was very patient. You remember when Moses went up onto the mountain to commune with the Lord to receive instructions from him? It says that Joshua waited patiently below for him. He learned through waiting. It's not easy to wait for anything. 
But also Joshua, I love this about him. I believe that he was prepared for what God had next because of personal worship. Exodus 33, 11 tells us that Joshua was a young man and he did not depart from the tabernacle. What goes on at the tabernacle? Worship of God. Joshua had a relationship with God. He was a man of worship. Yes, he was a man of war, but he was also a man of worship. I love the combination. Joshua was prepared through fierce battles, faithful service, personal worship, and also obedient steps of faith. Numbers chapter 13, the Bible tells us that it was Joshua and Caleb and 10 other men that went in to spy out the land of Canaan. And when they returned, 10 of the spies gave a bad report, yet Joshua and Caleb believed God and was willing, they were willing to take God at his word. And they said, listen, we need to go in. These people are our bread. You, know, you think you know, the giants, we, we can't take them. Listen, these guys are too big to miss. We need to go in. We, we can do this. God's with us. Joshua was prepared by God, but Joshua, folks, Joshua was also empowered by God. He was called by God, but he was also prepared by God, and he was empowered by God because Deuteronomy 34, 9 says, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. What was that day like? Moses placed his hands on Joshua and he was now full of the spirit of wisdom. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God and he gives liberally to all who will ask. Do you need wisdom? I need wisdom. I need to know what God wants. God, what's your will? What's your desire? The purpose that God had for Joshua's life could not be accomplished apart from God's Spirit working within him. And church, again, I'm not saying anything that you don't know or hasn't been stated. For us to fulfill the, God, the purpose that God has for us, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we've said it over. The Bible says it, but it needs to be repeated. Not by might, not by power, but by my... What is it? Spirit, Spirit says the Lord. That's what we need. And I think... I don't fully understand it, but God's been and maybe he's been ministering to your heart as well, but I've, I sense that we are entering into a new season as the church. Maybe Calvary Chapels, but the church in general, the world. I, we're, we're, on, we're on an election year. I don't know what's going to happen. There's already crazy things happening. I, I don't focus my attention on that. What I'm looking for is when all the world's going this way, I'm like, okay, Lord, what's, what's, what are we going to do? Like, what, what are you setting up for us? What, 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 what's next for us? But I think there's a new season in, in, in Calvary Chapel. I, I have, in the last few months, and, and Pastor Lloyd alluded to it, we watched the passing of Jeff Johnson go home to be with the Lord. Uh, we just attended Sharon Reese's memorial uh, and, and watched her go home to be with the Lord. I was at, I was at Kay's memorial, uh, Pastor Chuck's wife. Um, that was not that long ago. Um, and, and others. And what I'm, what I'm saying to you is in the last couple of months, this last year, what, what I'm seeing is I'm watching, and these are people that I have known practically my whole life, and I'm watching a generation pass. And, and it makes me a little bit concerned because these are the people that I have looked to, to follow in their footsteps, to emulate their example. And these guys were the chargers. These guys were the, these guys, were the guys when I was 25 going out to Florida with my wife and, and you know, two little boys to plant a church with two people in their living room. I was reading the Harvest book saying, man, this is powerful. I hope that I could have a story like these guys. And yet they're now entering into their reward. They're going home. And I feel like the word that that needs to be spoken to us who are alive and remain at the present time is be strong and courageous. As I was with them, I'm going to be with you. God hasn't stopped working just because he took them home and they entered into their reward. They ran their race, they finished. We are running our race. We need to run strong. We need to finish well. God's doing something new. I don't know what it is. I just want to be a part of it, whatever that looks like. Lord, just let us... Let us enter into that. Let us have confidence that there's, there's something new. This was a new opportunity for Joshua. A national tragedy brought new opportunity. Because it says, the Lord said, I want you to arise and I want you to go over the Jordan. You and all this people to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. The timing for Joshua was not later, but now. 
Now is the time. That moment, precisely at that moment, Joshua had been prepared and it was time to step into this calling that God had on his life for something new, something fresh that God was about to do. And make no mistake, it wasn't going to be easy. Listen, there's 31 kings on the other side of the Jordan just sharpening their swords. When are you guys getting here? I mean, they are, there's a battle on the other side. There's 31 kings that Joshua is going to have to square off with in warfare. Intense warfare, hand-to-hand combat. And the Lord says to Joshua, I love these words. He, he says to him, arise, go over. It's time. Take them over. Get up. And so Joshua was about to take these people into the promised land, crossing the Jordan River. And really, when you think about Canaan, Canaan, you know, isn't entering into heaven. Heaven is heaven. There's no battles there. Canaan is the victorious Christian life. Canaan is where you enter in. You cross over something. You know, wandering in the wilderness reminds us of that experience where you just, there's nothing really happening. There's just, there's nothing really, I mean, God's faithful, but, but there's no victory there. It's when you cross over the Jordan, that's when you enter in to that victorious Christian life. And Joshua is now taking them in. Moses couldn't take them in. By the way, the law couldn't take them in, but Joshua could. A picture of Jesus taking us across into the victorious life. And so they enter in. But I also want to point out, and this is important, that what God was calling Joshua to do was impossible. Impossible. There was no way that Joshua could lead a few million people over the Jordan into the promised land by himself. He needed the Lord. Listen, church, don't be surprised if the Lord brings you to an impossible, impossible task or calling to which you have to completely depend on Him. I, I know this room is full of, of believers here who God has led us into things that were so far beyond us that if He didn't show up, nothing was going to happen. You ever felt like that as a Christian? Lord, if you don't show up, if you don't, if you don't arrive, if, the, if you don't come through, we're, nothing's going to happen. We don't have it in ourselves to get it done. We don't, we don't have the charisma, the money, the budget, whatever, uh, which is basically the same thing. We don't have it. <laughs> we don't have it. We don't have the skill set. And I love it. I think the Lord delights in doing things that way. And the reason he delights in doing it that way is because when it's all done, there's not a person here that could say, look at me, look what I accomplished. You know, you know, and, and the Lord knows it wasn't us, it was him. He wants all the glory. Joshua was also given promises from God. And I'm getting close to my time, but he said, every every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, notice this, I have given it to you. I have. I already did. You haven't entered into it. God said, I've already given it to you. You've already given it to me? Yeah, I just want you to walk it out. He's going to have to believe that what God said was actually going to come to pass. I have given it to you. From heaven's perspective, it was already done. The work was done. The victory was already secured. God had given it to them. Every promise, listen, every promise of God will be tested. And there are often times when the circumstances in my life run contrary to the promises of God. And I don't, I have no idea how these two are going to come together and converge. This is, everything that you promised is the opposite of what's happening. And and it's in that place that I'm tested either to just fret or believe. To doubt or to trust. And oh, so many times God puts us in those places where we're in between and and we we don't, and everything on this side looks like it's not going to happen. And there's something there. you're, You're hanging on a passage. You understand? You're hanging on a verse. Wait, what do you think is going to happen? I I don't know. I just have this verse. That's what you're living on? Yes. How many of you ever just had your whole life hang on a verse, a sentence? My life is hung on a name, Jesus. Just one name. I mean, it's just, and God does that. And you just, it's so outside of your control. You've prayed every prayer you could pray. You've, you've, Sent every email you could do. You, you've done everything you can. And, and you know, unless God brings us across, we're not going across. We're just not going across. 
And then God comes through like only he can. So many more things I could comment on this, but for the sake of time. Joshua, I have given you the land. Verse 5, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. That right there to me is so significant. He, He not only had the promises, but he had the promise of God's presence. How I worked with Moses in the past, I'm going to work with you. Same God. Same God still wanting to work. You know, I think for sometimes, uh, for us, I, I speak for myself on this, but coming behind those who have gone before us in this movement of churches, you feel like you're standing on, on the shoulders of great men who, who have, have blazed the trail, and, and, and you don't feel like, you know, you're always striving to, I want to be able to do what they did. Actually, I would like to do more than they did. You know, you're, there's a... There's a I think a godly drive within us that God places to, 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 to persevere, to step out, to take risks, as Pastor Lloyd was saying. Just, I, I want that. I want to do that. I want to see God move. I want to see God work in my generation. When I, when I came back to the Lord, as Tom mentioned, I grew up, I grew up in a church that was born out of revival. I mean, it was, it was born out of revival. So my entire life from, from a toddler to a teenager to an adult, I mean, for 22 years, I mean, that was the environment that I was raised in. But it wasn't until I was 18 that I really, I came back to the Lord and gave my life to Christ and, I, you know, just fully surrendered to him. I mean, I know the Lord, I know scripture, I could quote it to benefit myself and, you know, use it to twist things up, you know, and, and I knew scripture that well. My parents would say, John, the Bible says, honor your father and mother. And I'd say it does say that, but it also says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. I mean, I would just use scripture, <laughs> twist it up. You know, I just knew God's word for the wrong reasons, but when I came back to the Lord, and, and, and from the time I was 18 years old, when I, I mean, I just got lit on fire by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, as, as, as Pastor Phil mentioned earlier, being baptized with the Holy Spirit changed my life. You know, I'm, I'm 51 now, and I'm a grandpa, which is wonderful. Um, but the, the amazing thing is, is from the time I was 18 to the present time, I, I've, I, I've prayed, God, I want to see revival. I hear all the stories. I've read the books. I know the guys that were there. I've preached in their pulpits. It's wonderful. Lord, do it in our day. Do it in our generation. Lord, let there be one more great outpouring of your spirit. Take us across, Lord. Take us over. Take us in. Let let, let us fight the battles that still need to be fought in our generation. They fought their battles. These are ours. These are ours. These are the ones that you've called us into. So so church, if I'm exhorting myself, be strong and of good courage. Enter into what God has for you. God's not done. Praise God for 25 years. Yes and amen. Lord, if you tarry, let's go 25 more. I mean, what do you want to do next? What's it look like? Lord, let it look like whatever you want it to look like. We have a saying at our church. And I don't always say this, but it just kind of happened over the last four years. There's so many things that, that God has done. But we have a saying in, in the group that we work together, the staff of people, that if we say, we've never, we've never done that before, when we say that, we, we should do that. We should do that. This is a saying. We just say, hey, we've never done that before. You know what? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. We've never done it before. Let's try it. And if it bombs, then it bombs. If it's a blessing, to God be the glory. I mean, yeah, just, just be willing to do perhaps what you haven't done before. What, what is God calling us into? What, what is he saying to us? What's next? Whatever it is, may God lead us. The Lord would say to Joshua and to the nation of Israel when they were about to cross the Jordan, the Ark of the Covenant was to go before them. The Ark of the Covenant, which represented the throne of God on the earth. And the Lord said to Joshua, listen, you need to stay at this particular distance from the Ark. Not too close, not too far away. And the reason? One, so you can see it, but also because you've never gone this way before. So the Ark was to go before them. And as soon as the priests holding the Ark put their foot in the Jordan, that's when it split. That's when it parted. 
and they were to keep their eyes on the ark and they were to follow through those waters that they had never been before. Oh, there was battles on the other side. Folks, listen, I, I think in this season, in this time, in America, in the church, etc., we got to keep our eyes on the one who sits upon the throne, the Lord Jesus. We have got to watch. We have got to, there's going to be people saying, you guys need to be doing this. I don't, I, don't, I'm, I don't think that's exactly what he wants me to do. Hey, you should be doing this as a church. How come you're not? You know what? It's interesting you say that. I think I'm just going to, I'm going to stay here. I'm going where Jesus is going. This, I'm going to follow this track. You know, it, where I live, and this is where I'll conclude. This is my first conclusion. Um, <laughs> my first conclusion, you know, where I live, not too far from here, well, it's um, by plane. Uh, you know, we, we live in a crazy state. How many of you are from California? Raise your hands. What, what are you doing here? Come, <laughs> come home. We need, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you transplants. No, it's fine. I know, I know. There's, I think U-Haul is like the number one company in California because of so many people that have moved. Uh, but anyways, my point is this. Um, where I live, it's a little crazy. There's, this, there's crazy things. We have a, a, a governor who is uh, typecast for the Antichrist. I mean, we have some things going on there. And uh, so, but, but what I realize is, is that this, this, for such a time as this, we're, we're here for this reason. This is why God, and, and I don't know what's going to happen next, but where I live, there's people that say, hey, listen, your church isn't political enough. You should be saying this and that. And I'm like, Whatever. You know, there's people saying, you're too political. You should not. I'm like, Pfft. you know, I'm just like, mm, I've got my eyes on the ark. I'm doing what, what I feel like Jesus wants me to do. And so that, that's my main thing. My main thing, our main thing has to be, that the main thing is the word of God. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, we need to save America, save America, save America. I have a saying. We need to save Americans. I don't think we're coming back to America like the Reagan days or whatever, whatever somebody's looking for, whatever they, they, they deem it, this is, we're going to save America. And I'm not saying we shouldn't fight for it or we shouldn't vote for it or whatever. Don't misunderstand. You're going to think I'm over here and you're going to be judgy. Don't do that. What I'm saying is there is a balance. We, we're called to save. Jesus said go into all the world. God just doesn't want to save America. He wants to save the world the world. And so keep your eyes on Jesus as we navigate through this. Be strong and have good courage. Hey, it's great what God has done, but he's taking us into something new. So what is that? Lord, show us. Show us. We are open. Would, would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? And can we pray together? Can we ask the Holy Spirit to show us in the days ahead? Lord, we don't, we don't know what we're doing. We need you. If we, we, if we ever needed you, we need you now. We need you now, God. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. And, and God, we confess that apart from you, we can do nothing. But Lord, your word tells us through Christ, we can do all things. And so we come to you as a humble people. Lord, we don't, we don't figure it out. Buddy, Lord. Christ, ask your Holy to reveal to us, Lord, what steps you want us to take, what Jordan you want us to cross. Lord, lead us in. Lord, help us to be strong and courageous, knowing that you go before us, you are with us. Lord, you are in us through the power of the Spirit. So have your way, Lord. Lord, we praise you for what you have done. Oh, Lord, but we look forward to what you are yet going to do. You're the same God. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.